okay. This is one of the most energetic audiences we have ever had, right? You guys are very excited. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Drinkwater. Welcome to Campus London. I got a whoop, I love it. Um, <laughs> without further ado, I would welcome to the stage Demis Asabis of DeepMind. Thanks. <laughs> And you can't see, but we have our names on sheets of paper, just in case we forget <laughs> on the way to the stage, which is quite fun, right? Yep, exactly. Demis Asabis is the founder and CEO of DeepMind, a neuroscience-inspired AI company bought by Google in 2014 as the largest European acquisition to date. He's led projects including AlphaGo, the first program to ever beat a professional player at the game of Go. Demis was a child prodigy who finished his A-levels two, level two years early before coding the multi-million selling simulation game Theme Park at only 17. After graduating Cambridge with a double first in computer science, he founded the pioneering games company Elixir Studios. After a PhD at UCL and since at MIT and Harvard, Demis founded DeepMind. His research connecting memory with imagination was listed in the top 10 scientific breakthroughs of 2007 by the journal Science. He is a five times World Games champion, recipient of the Royal Academy of Engineering's Silver Award and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Demis, welcome. Thanks, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> So um, we have an audience here of entrepreneurs, startup workers, many of whom are kind of working in the AI and ML space. And it's been really interesting watching the sheer interest and buzz in the media for the last kind of couple of years. Um, if you were talking to a lay person, and our audience is not lay people, I would argue, how would you define DeepMind and what you guys do? Well, the, our mission statement at DeepMind has been um, sort of quite simple to state, really. So the idea is that we're going to try and fundamentally solve intelligence. And then our belief is that once you've done that, you could use it for practically anything else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, more prosaically, the way we're trying to do that is by building learning algorithms. So algorithms that are very general, that um, learn how to do things rather than being programmed uh, with a solution, actually learn directly from experience or directly from data. So effectively find structure uh, on their own. Um, and then the plan is if you have some, such a general system, uh, you could apply it to all sorts of domains where there's you know, huge amounts of data or huge amounts of complexity, um, perhaps so much complexity that even the human experts, the best human experts in that area can't comprehend it all unaided. And the idea would be to create this amazingly powerful tool which um, those experts can use to make uh, you know, further, bigger breakthroughs in their own areas, um, you know, areas of science, healthcare, social, you know, almost, almost every area you can think of. Mm. I'm kind of really interested in, you know, uh, you've been uh, a world-class chess player, you've been an academic, uh, you've been a games designer. How have all of those fields, what have they brought to, to DeepMind and the culture that you've created there? Well, I think uh, all of my experience, if you, look, if you look back at them, you know, people sort of think um, it's quite an eclectic sort of path I've taken with quite a few different things. But my plan has always been, um, since I can remember, to work on AI ultimately, sort of do DeepMind, and, uh, or a company like DeepMind. And I always felt um, from a very young age that that would be one of the most profound things that you know, could be worked on, and it would also be extremely interesting and fun to work on. Uh, and the impact of it could be enormous. And um, all the things I chose to do you know, from around the age of you know, 14 or 15 were with that end goal in mind. So you know, I, I started off in games and learned programming. Um, games themselves ended up being a huge part of what we do at DeepMind in terms of we use simulations, including games, to obviously develop our AI algorithms in and test their performance. It's very convenient to do that. Um, I'm really fascinated by the idea of simulations in general um, uh, as a way of generating data. So you don't have to have um, uh, used data that's already out there. You can actually generate your own data, synthetic data, if you have virtual environments and simulations, which I think is an important point maybe we should touch on later. Uh, and then the neuroscience component was sort of finding out about how the brain works. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the, the human brain is the only example we have of such a general learning system, the type of system we would like to build and mimic uh, artificially. Uh, so it's like the existence proof. So it's seems to me like we should, it's worth spending a lot of effort trying to understand how um, the brain works, at least on a functional level, um, if not on a, on a kind of, uh, you know, detail.
detail, biological level. And that would inspire new ideas about algorithms and representations and so on. Mm. Um, and simultaneously, because I never like doing things just for one reason, ideally you're, you're, you're experiencing things for multiple reasons, is you know, one was learning the neuroscience, another was understanding how academia worked, how cutting edge research worked in the best labs in the world, mm. what was good about those um, environments, what was bad, um, comparing that against startup environments. Mm. Um, you know, and actually DeepMind is a sort of hybrid of mm. uh, what I learned from the best practices of the best startups uh, and what I learned, you know, were best practices from the best, you know, academic labs and, um, and try to fuse the, the, the best of those worlds together, which is, you know, one way of describing DeepMind's sort of fairly unique culture. Mm. So all of those so to answer your question, like all of those experiences, I've tried to utilize them in some way, including mm. my chess, which is probably the fundamental way I approach all the planning that I do, and you know, in, whether that's business or anything else, uh, you know, I, I, th I think about things in, with that kind of logical planning mm. um, that you train up when you, when you play chess for very young. Yeah, that's interesting. I was reading a piece this week about um, tests deploying chess in schools for eight to nine-year-old children really helps to kind of focus, you know, particularly over energetic kids. I was always the kind of kid that was, stop doing that. <laughs> um, I'm curious about, you know, games in general, whether it's chess, whether it's um, Elixir and Theme Park, whether mm. it's Go, this seems to have been a very big theme in your life. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about kind of how you first got into games? Yeah, so um, I guess I got into games firstly through chess and I was uh, aged about four when um, I, I, was, I found out, I mean, I can't remember this, but um, my dad told me later I saw him play my uncle at chess and uh, I apparently asked them how to play and they were sort of humoring me. It's like, you know, obviously I can't learn, but they, they started trying to teach me. And then after a couple of weeks, uh, I was beating both of them. And, and so then they thought, well, maybe something strange is happening here. And they took me to, you know, chess clubs. And I was always winning the age group sort of many years above um, my age. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, ended up playing for England and so on. And the thing is, I think it's an amazing thing for a child to train in because it treats you so many meta skills um, to you know to do with obviously planning problem solving imagination um, how to how to sort of cope with pressure um, and you know competition what it means to be uh, excel at something and 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 the work that that takes all of these are meta lessons that you can sort of then take into any okay. other field. Mm. So I actually don't think it's so much about um, the chess itself. Mm. I just think it's an incredible sort of training ground, if you like, uh, uh, for the mind. And then I've expanded that to later on in my career, in my games career, you know, I learned many other games which are very interesting, including Go, but also poker and lots of other things. And if I was to actually design an MBA, um, one of the things you could do is you could design it around games, actually, and, and different games teaching you different skills. Mm. Um, that I think are really important in business, but also in science and many other things. Uh, and I, for you know, for the first until I was at least sort of in my early twenties, I used to effectively play games professionally as as either my main thing or as a side hobby. And I used to view it as like a you know a, a, a gym for the mind. Yeah. So there's not very many cases in 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 uh, real life where you can practice scenarios again and again and test how you would you know you would cope under that pressure or what this, your decision making mm. where, where there aren't any real really big consequences of that mm. right so in, in a way that obviously is connected to the idea of simulations where you know the, the whole point of using simulations for the AI systems to learn in is that they can try out things in the simulation mm. which is totally has you know it's totally safe it has no consequences but they can still learn from it mm. so in a way what we're doing with the, the our AI algorithms is kind of what I did to myself yeah. when I was training as, as as a kid. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Um, yeah. So my parents met playing Go, which I find, um, you know, it's the world's most complicated. I've tried to learn it so many times. Um, oh. And I'd love to ask a bit more about, obviously with AlphaGo, you've had a couple of dazzling um, uh, wins in mm. terms of Seoul against a, an incredible human champion yep. who himself has gone on to win, I sure. think, 13 matches since then. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit more about, I mean, we've already talked a bit about gaming as a way to kind of show capability to kind of to help algorithms train in a kind of safe environment. But I'd love to know more about particularly the the first, um, you know, the, that moment in Seoul, the first kind yeah. of trip that you guys made out there where 
how, how was that? Like, where did well, that notion come from? It's, it's an amazing, uh, uh, well, I mean, there's so many things to say about that. Is, is first of all, the, the Korea match, which was, which was really special because it was the first big one, uh, was, was uh, generally a once in a lifetime type of experience. I mean, the whole country, it's quite hard to imagine because Go's not very big here in the West, but in Korea, it's just absolutely massive. And literally the whole country came to standstill. So, you know, on the airport on the way home, like, you know, the, the check-in, the check-in person was, you know, recognized me. And it was, it was a bit like my driver was telling me that it was like uh, for, for one week only, I was the second most famous British person in Korea after David Beckham. So, which for a pro as you guys all know, as researchers and programmers and business people, that sort of never happened. So it was quite funny to experience it as, a, as for one week, right? And then come back to London and as if nothing had happened. But um, London, like, so it was, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, what is go? Um, but the, the, it was actually a culmination of 20 years of, uh, of thinking because um, I learned go uh, relatively uh, late in my games career. So I learned it in Cambridge and Go is actually quite popular in the West in universities, especially in maths departments, because it, because it appeals to mathematicians and physicists because of its of the nature of the game. And uh, so I learned it there, and I, I actually you know really loved the game, uh, but I didn't have enough time to get to sort of practice it to the to the level you would require to get really good. But it always stayed with me. And then um, David Silver, who is the head of reinforcement learning at DeepMind, but also we were undergrads together at Cambridge, and he was my CTO on my first games company. So we've had a long history together of working on things together. When we were programming computer games together, we, we talked, we, you know, I taught him how to play Go. And we, this was just after Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov, and, we, and we, we knew that Go was much harder than chess. And we thought then even that we thought about building a Go program. This was like 20 years ago. And we thought about building it in the way that Deep Blue was built. So, you know, a handcrafted set of heuristics uh, that sort of run at brute force with brute force search. Uh, which is what basically what Deep Blue is. And we, we, really, we quickly realized, thinking it through, that that wouldn't work for Go because it's so contextual. Like you could, there's no way you could program enough if-then mm. statements to figure out you know, how should or this part of the board affect this other part of the board in, in, in the kind of myriad of configurations you could have. You just can't do it. Um, and it was obvious once you started thinking about it, that wasn't going to work. So we, we, we parked that thought back then, but we also agreed that Go, that would made Go really worthwhile working on. Because if you could crack Go and get it to world champion level, then probably you must have done something pretty significant in terms of, of AI, more significant than something like Deep Blue, which was quite narrow. Mm. And so we kept that with us. And in fact, after the games company, you know, we, we sold off the IP of that to Microsoft and other, other people. We then, um, I went, you know, I went back to do a PhD in neuroscience, and he went to do a PhD on computer Go and reinforcement learning in, in Canada. And so he actually followed that track a lot more. Yeah. And then we, we sort of came back together at DeepMind with both of our two different experiences ready to actually tackle this problem. Mm. Um, and, and so AlphaGo was the culmination of, although we had, we, we've been working on it for about three years, and so two years up to the Lisa Doll match. Mm. But the actual thinking behind it and the, the, the idea to do it was sort of 20 years on. Mm. So it was really like the end of a, 20-year culmination of, of um, effort and thinking. Um, and, the, you know, and just to mention that Lisa Do and Kajay, the, the Chinese champion, um, they're absolutely incredible human beings, obviously incredibly creative. I mean, the amount of dedication and craft it takes to be at that level or at anything, but as, at these art forms, and Go is an art, is unbelievable. And they're both such gracious people as well. And I think one reason AlphaGo was received quite well by the Go community was that um, because I'm a games player and actually several other people on the team are, I think that they could instinctively tell, even though it was a language barrier, that I really appreciated and understood their, their capabilities and their talent mm -hmm. and, and their art form. It wasn't just something to be conquered. Yeah. And I think that that's what, in the past, a lot of computer sort of machine versus human champion uh, uh, games that's happened in draft and it happened in chess ended up being very antagonistic because mm -hmm. I think that the programmers, brilliant as they were, most of them were not professional professional games players or something in the right. past. So I just think they thought of it as this um, Mount Everest they had to climb, but it's not an inanimate object. It's, it's, a, you know, it's another brilliant human being with their own brilliant craft they're bringing to it. And I, I think there was just a deep respect from both sides about the, you know, the AlphaGo at the end of the day, although it's a machine, it's a human endeavor that built the machine. And we appreciate that the art and the artistry that the, the, these amazing people are displaying. Right. Um, and what was very cool is, as you mentioned afterwards, 
you know, both Lisa Dahl and Kajay uh, went on huge winning streaks, yeah. and, and it, I think it inspired them to play, you know, new ideas and new moves. Um, uh, actually, Lisa Dahl went on a kind of an eight or nine game winning streak, and, and Kajay is currently on a 13 game winning streak. Yeah. But last time I tweeted about Lisa Dahl, he lost the next game. So I hope I haven't jinxed. Uh, I hope I haven't jinxed Kajay because I just and tweeted that as well. I think so. what I love about that as well is, you know, when I'm going to ask you about this later, um, the worries we have around AI, but that story in particular makes me think that these 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 programs can help us be more creative and more imaginative and be more, right? I think so. And I think that's the key thing about these matches. It wasn't actually the fact that we won. Although, of course, that was, you know, that was great. But the, was the, it was the way it won and the types of things it did. You know, it, it wasn't just regurgitating human ideas and just copying them and just more efficiently uh, calculating. Mm -hmm. It actually came up with genuinely creative ideas, original ideas. And the cool thing about Go is that I always talk about it is an, it's art but it's objective art because at the end of the day someone wins you know you can measure was the was you know we can all any one of us here could come up with a novel move you know we could play a random move and it would be a original move in some sense but the point is 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 it any good did it help uh, uh win was it was it pivotal in winning the game and then you can only then can you go back and judge was that move you know genuinely creative a, a creative brilliancy or not mm. uh, it's not enough for it just to be novel right it has to be effective yeah. um so and that is a matter you know that's not a subjective it's not a matter of opinion it, it's you can calculate that out after the fact so and, and AlphaGo is created now you know in all the games it's played countless um, new ideas genuinely new ideas that were you know and this is a game that um, humans have played at a professional level for you know hundreds of years it's existed for more than you know 3,000 years so you could argue it's one of the one of the things that we've contemplated the most as humanity, a co you know, continual thing for 3,000 years that we've contemplated very heavily. Uh, and yet AlphaGo was able to find totally new ideas. And um, so not only has that directly influenced what people are trying out now, because they're all analyzing all these games, but also uh, it's freed up their minds too. Like Fan Hui, who is the European champion who, who, who now consults with us, he said it, to me that, you know, it's, he felt like he was, his mind was free from, from the, the shackles of tradition. He could now think unthinkable thoughts about what, you know, that he wouldn't have to be constrained by the received wisdom that, that had been down to him. Yeah. So I think it's going to inspire a whole new level of creative exploration in the game of Go. As a games player, have you played Alpha Go? How was it? Yes. So this is pretty funny, actually, because um, you know I'm 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 not that strong at Go, and and uh, within a few very early on, it was already much stronger <laughs> than me. So it would have been much point playing against it, but. Um, I've actually, what was really was more fun was uh, playing with AlphaGo. So um, out in China, we had this, uh, in, in the recent match we played, we had this interesting, vari uh, we had the match against Kajay, but we also had some interesting other formats. And one of the formats we had was called Pair Go, where you play as a team, and uh, it's, it's two of you normally, and uh, you take turns to play, mm. and with no conferring. So you're trying to kind of infer what your partner's trying to play and what they're trying to achieve. And, uh, and we had a version of that where AlphaGo would be your partner uh, and, you know, playing, you, know, you playing alternate moves with AlphaGo. So it was really cool. We, I, I had a game of that with uh, one of our programming team. And it was a very fun experience, actually, mm. um, sort of having AlphaGo on your side and, and um, you know, solving your problems, solving sort of correcting the errors in your play and making up for your, for your yeah, things you hadn't seen. But it's so interesting, the idea of seeing a machine as powerful as that assess how predictable you are as a human, right? Or something about decision making there that's, that's quite Yeah, fun. no, it's very interesting. I mean, it's sort of, what's interesting is that the, this version of AlphaGo doesn't have any uh, opponent modeling. So it isn't trying to adjust itself to what you're doing. It's, it's going to, it assumes it's playing itself effectively. That's how it was trained. Uh, but you could create another version that also tries to predict uh, maybe, you know, play moves that it knows that you're going to be able to, you know, uh, uh, sort of understand the motif for and, mm. and things like that. I think it could be quite an interesting variation. Mm. Yeah. So I think every, every founder CEO has an incredibly hard job, but I think more than most, you really do. I think particularly the area you're working in, um, the potential social impact, it's, it's a really fascinating space. Mm. And so much of it depends on the intent of the creator. And it sounds, even talking in our brief conversation so far, there's been a huge amount of intent behind DeepMind's work so far. Yeah. Um, 
How do you think about that, that whole notion of intent? Yeah. Well, look, we take that responsibility extremely seriously. So, you know, we and we always have done from the beginning of DeepMind. When we started DeepMind in 2010, it's not like, you know, it's hard for, I mean, everyone in the room you know, knows, you know, AI is a huge buzzword now, and many of you are working in that, but it wasn't like that in 2010, right? If you said the word AI to a VC, they would have just rolled their eyes at you. You know, now they'll throw $10 million at you, right? So, <laughs> so you'll compete they to hope. do that. So, so you know, it just, it just wasn't like that just a few years ago, seven years ago. And, and, um, but even then, we were planning, we, we had this big mission in mind, mm. and we were planning for success. You know, like we really thought we could make great progress on that, that the time was right, there was enough compute power, there was enough data, there were interesting algorithms, the beginnings of like deep learning was there, we, we knew about reinforcement learning, all of these things came true in the end. And, um, and if, you know, it's always been in the back of our mind, if it really is going to be one of the most significant technologies we ever invent, humans ever invent, then of course you've got to take the ethics of that very seriously. And we've been from the beginning at the sort of forefront, uh, you know, in terms of thought leadership on how uh, you know, society should think about this, how the other big companies should, should act. You know, we were a big driving force behind this thing called Partnership on AI, which is a big um, uh, collaboration between, you know, all the big uh, tech companies mm -hmm. uh, trying to come together to start thinking about the ethical deployment and use of these technologies. And then further afield, you know, we talked to lots of academics, including um, people like Nick Bostrom and, you know, Future Humanity Institute at Oxford and Cambridge. There's lots of think tanks now around that are thinking about the potential impact impact of this technology and um, they're regular visitors to our offices and we have regular brainstormings with them and you know we're, we're going to be it's going to be very interesting um, you know next few years yeah. to see how to map that out obviously we don't have all the answers and no one does mm. but I think um, we've got to start really tr uh, 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 thinking about these issues seriously um, and also doing a lot of research so both technical research on safe, safety aspects and interpretability and transparency of these systems and bias in the systems so all these technical challenges challenges and then there's the ethical challenges of you know distributing the the, the increased productivity mm -hmm. to as many you know so everyone benefits not just a few people so there's sort of huge challenges on on the whole gamut range of things from the technical side uh, to the the ethical and, mm. and you know policy side big job yeah. um, and I guess what do you make of the debate around automation and jobs do you see this as being the latest wave of Luddite-esque concerns around how we'll rethink workplace you know the workplace in general or do you think it's something more profound? Look, I think it's it's not clear yet. So I think that um, you, you know we've seen any time a major new technology comes in, it creates uh, a big change, right? So that we've known that from the industrial revolution. Uh, you know, the internet did that. Uh, mobile did that. So you could view it as another. Uh, I mean, that's still not to underplay underplay its importance, but mm. another really big uh, disruption event in, in the, that lineage. Mm -hmm. um, so that's certainly one you know, reasonable view, in which case uh, society will just adapt like it's done with uh, all the other things and, and some jobs will, will, will go, but newer, hopefully better, higher quality jobs will, will become possible, uh, be, uh, uh, facilitated by those new technologies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's definitely gonna happen in the, in the shorter term. Yeah. Um, the question is then, is this really some kind of one time epochal event yeah. that's beyond yeah. the, the level of even those big things. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think you, you could argue that it might be. Um, and then the question then comes is, you know, it does become more profound around, uh, well, firstly, um, if you've got all this increased productivity, you, you need to make sure that's distributed fairly. Um, but I think that's more of a political issue than a technical one. Um, but then the question comes is if you've managed to do that, and assuming you can do, you know, you as a society have managed to do that, then then uh, the next question comes is about you know things like purpose and uh, and and you know those kind of higher level questions, mm. um, which I think are very you know uh, interesting things to think about and and you know we need to do a lot more uh, uh, thought of, you know sort of research about those kinds of things how how that might go. Mm. So I want to shift gears a bit and um, ask you a bit more about DeepMind in London. Yeah. Um, you know you're headquartered in the UK. Um, I'd love to. I know that you. Um, I know that. You know, um, I'd love to hear a bit more about how, how you've grown in the UK and how particularly London has kind of helped the company. Obviously, 2010 was a very different world. We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Um, but tell us a bit more about, about your thinking. You know, some companies in your position would have moved over to the yes. States. Yes. So I think most, most companies probably would have done. Yeah. So I think... Um, 
Yeah, it's quite a few interesting things to say that. Firstly, you know, I, I was born in London and I'm a, I'm a sort of proud, uh, born, and, born and bred Londoner. And I, I've always wanted to sort of show that, you know, I obviously visited Silicon Valley and, and knew people out there. And, and also I'd been to MIT and Harvard and seen the East Coast. And there is this view over there that, that like, you know, these kind of deep technology companies could only be created in Silicon Valley. Certainly back in 2010, that was definitely the prevailing view. And uh, I wanted to show that that was, you know, one of the many reasons I've been in London is obviously I, I was living here uh, and, I, and a lot of my start, you know, the people that started with, uh, with me were also already based here. But I also felt that um, that just wasn't true. You know, we have world-class universities here, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, Imperial, UCL, Kings, all these amazing places that are producing just as much talent as, uh, at just as high quality as these other places in the US. Mm -hmm. So it just felt like it was, um, they just hadn't been galvanized properly. And there just wasn't the level of ambition. Um, mm. But if you, there was just no reason, real reason, why it couldn't be done here. Um, and one of the reasons you could say back then was um, lack of funding, but you could get funding from the US but still be based here, which is what we ended up doing. Uh, and it was a funny story, like our first um, yeah, big and major investor was, was Peter Thiel's fund, Founders Fund. And uh, I remember the first time I pitched to him, we, you know, he decided to invest within the first meeting. But it took about three months before it actually was closed because uh, the main sticking point was he wanted us to move to Silicon Valley because mm. he, at that time, he'd never invested outside of, uh, I think definitely outside of the US, maybe not even outside of the West Coast uh, because <laughs> he felt it was that, you know, the, the sort of power of Silicon Valley was that sort of mythical that you couldn't create a successful, you know, big technology company or anywhere else. And eventually we decided, we convinced him that there was um, good reasons to be in London. Actually, one of the things was at the time, I thought it was going to be a competitive advantage because mm -hmm. in terms of talent acquisition, because if you're, cheaper. yeah, well, it's not partly cheaper, but actually because, um, you know, if you're, say, a you know, physics PhD out of Cambridge mm -hmm. and you didn't want to move to the US, uh, but you also didn't want to move to, the, to work in the city for a hedge fund, which was you know, luckily becoming less and less uh, attractive to people, you know, 2010 uh, after the crash. Uh, and I think that's good. Um, then, then we, you know, but you want to do something that's going to really push you to the yeah. limit intellectually and, and utilize all your skills. Then there aren't, there wasn't that many other options in, in the UK or even Europe, I would argue, uh, for that type of talent to be fully uh, feel sort of fully uh, satisfied with with yeah. with the, with the challenge of their of their job, so I felt like we would have sort of Europe to ourselves for a while, which is kind <laughs> of how it was, and and that actually built up our uh, initial uh, you know first sort of fifty people or so, mm. uh, which was the critical mass then we needed to, to go go beyond that. Of course, now everyone knows that secret. Plus, also there's all, the, all every, there's loads of startups now in deep technology, and I hope there's going to be many more. Um, Hopefully, you know, DeepMind's made it easier for all of you guys to raise money because we've shown that this is possible. You can get a great exit, and and there is that talent here, and the drive, and the and the and the ability to create those kinds of companies mm. here, which is partly what we wanted to show. And and I, I think you know I'm really pleased to see uh, you know other success stories like it, you know, Improbable and Magic Pony and all these other things mm. that have uh, have happened, and and reinforcing the fact that yeah, this can be done anywhere, and and, and London's an amazing and the UK is an amazing place to do that. No, I couldn't agree more. I feel very strongly about that. I think, um, you know, with Cognition X recently, um, we've got our residency program applications, our residency program applications open now. I know a lot of you guys are applying for it. It's our six month growth program uh, for machine learning powered startups. That's my pitch over quickly. <laughs> um, it's a really good time for companies in this vertical right now. Mm. Um, for a lot of the guys in the audience who are sort of post seed, yeah. kind of trying to kind of particularly commercialization, um, what would be your advice for them as founders? Yeah, I, so I was thinking a little bit about this. I mean, um, you know, there's a few things I've learned through the two. I mean, I've, I've sort of been involved in several startups, but two main ones that I ran, right? My games company and then DeepMind. And uh, again, my games company is called Elixir Studios. And what I found is actually that running a company is incredibly hard, right? We all, you know, all of you guys know that. But it, it actually doesn't really matter if your idea is a smaller idea or a really big idea. It's still just as hard. So and actually, there's a lot of advantages about it being a bigger idea in terms of exciting, you know, co-founders and start and top talent, getting uh, investors excited, uh, and also for you, you yourself, when things get hard, if you're deal if you're actually tackling a really big problem uh, mm -hmm. that really is important uh, to you personally, but also important to the world, I think that can get you through a lot of hard yeah. times. So I would actually say it's it's sort of 
counterintuitively, like a big going for a bigger idea actually can sometimes be easier. Um, so that was one thing. Second thing is, um, you know, I, I, one thing I kind of imported in, in, in my own thinking from Silicon Valley, even though I wasn't wasn't, wasn't building the company there, was their level of sort of ambition and sort of bravado in some ways. So when my first company, I would, you know, we would raise a little bit of money and we'd be like very British about it. So like, oh, we'll raise like a couple hundred thousand, you know, half a million, like small raise. And then we'll, we'll, we'll have some milestone and we, we'll wait to prove that out till before we even dare to talk about another raise because like, you know, we didn't say, we hadn't done what we had said yet. And so, you, you know, you can do it like that and it's very slow to build it hard. And of course things are unpredictable because it's you know you're doing a startup and sometimes things don't work and so on and um, and then any small thing can kind of kill you then because you, you haven't got much leeway but that's not the way that the big US the, the kind of US companies that end up being successful they just they're always raising they're raising like million you know they're going for big raises all the time right and I just sort of realized that actually that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because obviously if you've got all of that money and that runway and that leeway you, you've got much more time to figure out how you know correct okay, your then. mistakes so you, you actually in the end, you end up becoming more successful, partly because you projected more success. So it's sort of it's this weird thing of like just being a little bit more um, uh, ambitious and and brave about uh, about you know what you're claiming to do and what you're doing. Not go into kind of hype because that doesn't help, but actually just in terms of um, projecting your, your the ambitions of what you're going to try and do. Mm -hmm. And then obviously it helps if you have you're starting with a big idea that really matters. Um, so yeah. So we've talked a lot um, tonight about the, the kind of very long term, but I'd love to get you thinking about the next 10 years with DeepMind. Hmm. Um, what do you hope that will happen in those 10 years for the company? Yeah, so my big hope, and I think we're just approaching the point where we're going to be able to start doing this, is applying um, all these learning techniques we're building, learning algorithms, uh, to science itself. Mm. So actually sort of, you know, we use the scientific method to create these algorithms, but actually uh, then reapplying them back into other domains of science, like, you know, quantum chemistry or protein folding or this whole bunch of areas we're looking at. And to, you know, what I'm really looking forward to is the first big breakthrough that comes in a really hard area of science that makes a huge difference uh, you know, to the scientific or, or, or medical community that was um, in a large part helped by you know, an AI tool uh, in tandem being used by experts in those, in those areas. Mm. So I think in the next 10 years we're going to start seeing, you know, my hope would be in the, you know, a couple of years from now we're going to start seeing that happen and then by 10 years maybe it's going to be quite routine, mm. um, which I think is going to be unbelievably revolutionary if that, if that can happen. Um, we talked right at the beginning of the conversation about games as an art, and I was really interested in your Desert Island Discs um, that you and Christopher Nolan are friends. Yes. Inception is my favourite film. Oh, right, cool. It's very yeah. exciting for me yeah. that you know him. Um, I think we've talked <laughs> a lot. Just had to get it in, guys. What can I say? Um, we've just been talking a little bit about, about science, and I think um, something that struck me a few years ago, I think Eric Schmidt did a great talk about this, about this English notion of arts versus science rather mm. than arts and science. Um, when you're thinking about DeepMind, do you... You know, you've just talked about the kind of science element of what you hope, the discoveries you hope will come out in the next 10 years. Yeah. How much does the notion of art and the sort of artistry of, of the area you're working in influence your thinking? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I, I'm one of those people that doesn't really see that boundary between arts and sciences. I think that, you know, it's all about uh, 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 trying to understand the human condition and, and, and express it, right? And I think uh, the best science is like that too, is, is artistic. So if you, if you were to tell me what separates the, you know, the, 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 good scientists from the truly great ones. It's not their technical ability, it's their creative ability. Mm. And, um, and you know, uh, we're lucky enough at DeepMind to have a lot of those people. And I think that, you know, they apply that kind of creative flair that you would normally associate maybe with artists all the time in their, in their scientific work. Uh, in terms of uh, you know coming up with new uh, uh, ideas for for ways to to you know build these algorithms and, and achieve the, the types of functions that we want, mm. so um, you know and, and I also think you know another thing that we do which is maybe interesting for people here is that I've tried to apply the scientific method to uh, organisational design. Mm -hmm. So actually, the design of the company itself, uh, I, I try and use the scientific method on on that too. Which I mean, the scientific method, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful ideas humans have ever had. And mm -hmm. yet, I don't think you know we apply it in science, obviously, but I think it can be more broadly applicable. This sort of uh, 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 you know that using that technique. So, um, but if your question is, you know, will AI be able to create? I, I don't. I mean, I don't know if that is a side question. Oh, that, that's interesting. So, so Duke Deck, the company here, they are 
Ed, the founder, is a Cambridge educated yeah. composer who learned to code, and you might know them. Yes, I know um, them well. But yeah, great. I, I don't know, I'm curious about that because I think if you look at Nolan's films, for example, a lot of it's around memory, artistry, the human maze. You yes, know, that's why I was so, condition. I was actually so, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm a big, I'm sort of a fanboy of Christopher Nolan's, and I, I was you so too. pleased to, 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 to meet him, uh, finally meet him sort of last year. And, uh, I, I just love all his films, and what's really interesting is I felt like it was my my scientific life was mirroring mm. his interest in his films okay. because he, you know, there's obviously Memento, Memento, which was great, which was on Hippocampus and Memory, which is what I did for my PhD, and then Inception's about imagination, uh, and then obviously you know he's he's very interested in AI and mm. and all of these things as well. So I just think. Um, you know the way he thinks about it's, it's just a really unique film director I would say you know into the way he thinks about uh, 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 his his and, and researches his uh, topics mm. it's very cool so I'd love to end on a few very short fill in the blank questions I'm gonna hand over to you guys in a minute so do be thinking of your questions um, my next holiday will be two uh, I'm not sure actually I don't have many holidays but I think it's <laughs> gonna be uh, I, I like the idea of going to Costa Rica apparently there's direct flights there now so maybe I'll do that at Christmas <laughs> I always find inspiration in? Um, films, actually. Hmm. Any Good other films. recommendations beyond Christopher Nolan? Uh, oh, gosh. Um, well, yes, I mean, there's like so many. Uh, it's hard to say. Christopher Nolan is one of my best. I mean, I, I would say he's, he's one of the, the people I get most inspired by. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, a book I recommend all the time is? So uh, recently, actually, it's been Sapiens by mm, uh, so Yuval good. Harari. I think that's a really great book. There's mm. so many interesting things. There's not many times I read a book where, like, I've come out with 20 new, you know, like, ideas I hadn't thought about before. And, yeah. and that book made me think like that. Mm. So. Um, one thing I would say to founders is? Um, one thing I'd say to founders. Uh, you know, I would say, like, make sure that, that you're starting your company for the right reason. So, you know, I, I think a lot of, again, it's quite fashionable to do startups, right? And I think it's great, but I think you really should find your passion and make sure that what you're doing, you really actually genuinely care about and it's genuinely important rather than you're doing it just to make money or mm. um, some other ancillary reason. That's a lovely note to end on. So we're gonna hand over to the audience. Um, a few gram rules because we only have 15 minutes. Um, please, no comments. Please keep questions short and let's not do too much pitching. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry to ask. Okay, a gentleman uh, here in the purple t shirt. And we've got some microphones coming in. Yes. Is your research helping you to understand the human mind more? And are there any insights about how people think that you might want to share? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, we 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 hope that um, that I, I mean I, the way I pitch it is that and the way I think about it is that the journey we're on trying to trying to distill intelligence into an algorithmic construct. If we compare that ultimately to the way the human mind works, I think it's going to uncover a lot of mysteries about our own minds. So we have a big neuroscience group at DeepMind. It's about thirty five people. We do fMRI experiments. We collaborate with labs around the world. It's led by a guy called Matt Botvin. He's this brilliant professor from Princeton, and we push both. Uh, we look at ideas that we want to test on machine learning and sort of validate them. Like, does the brain use that as well? Because that's a good that's a good uh, piece of evidence that we're on the right track. Um, but we also, uh, you know, I think some things have sparked ideas about things we should look at in the brain. So, um, you know, the way that we we've we've done this thing called meta RL or meta learning. So, learning to learn, uh, and and how does the brain do that? And we've built that in machine learning first, and now we're looking at it in the brain. Like, which brain areas are responsible? for uh, uh, learning to learn. Um, and you know, we've, we've got some good results on that actually pretty soon. OK, and then I've got one here. Simon Nadolski. Uh, in another talk, you mentioned that you're, one of your ambitions is to make the scientific inquiry, the process of making science, more efficient than otherwise it is in academia. Could you share some tips with us on how you achieve it on a daily basis? Yes, so uh, people often ask me about it. The problem is, is that uh, it's not like a list of three things that, that you can just do. Uh, it's sort of you know, dozens of smaller things that add up. But what I will tell you is one thing. So the problem with academia is um, that it's, 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 uh, it's got, obviously got tons of smart people in it, 
but there's no coordination at all, right? So everybody is sort of, it's almost like brownie emotion. Everyone is kind of exploring what they think is best. And of course, you know, lots of great creative things come out of that. But the problem is, is that if you're, uh, uh, they're not added to, adding to each other's knowledge quite as efficiently as they could be if there was a bit more coordination. And also it's difficult if what you're trying to achieve is a very difficult, ambitious problem. It, and it needs like dozens of experts to come together to work together with their own complementary expertises. That's quite hard to organize in academia as well. So the way we do it at DeepMind is that um, we set out, uh, we have a roadmap, like a 20 year roadmap. It's more detailed the nearer term, obviously, that, that we are, like a year out. But it's 20 years and what we have is um, capabilities that we would like our algorithms to have, um, maybe informed by neuroscience or animal psychology or, or from various domains. Um, and then we have benchmarks that we create uh, that we would like to test those capabilities against, right? Whether it's a game or some other kind of benchmark. But we don't prescribe um, the solutions to those problems. We order, like we, we say, everyone knows what the roadmap is and everyone knows the ordering of the capabilities we would like uh, in which order uh, that makes sense according to the roadmap. Um, but we don't specify the solutions. Like I might have an idea for how we could solve, you know, uh, give our agents imagination. Um, but my idea is not, is worth the same as anyone else's idea. So any Anybody, even the most junior researcher can put ideas into the into the melting pot and then uh, it's the ideas that survive the scientific method i.e survive the objective benchmarking that end up uh, we end up converging around and putting more resources on, onto uh, and in, by doing that you get you, you know all the creativity still bottom up so like like the best science is done so um, you know the, all the solutions come bottom up but the, 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 there's a sort of loose coordination from top down um, to do with uh, uh, the ordering of, 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 of the tasks. Um, and that, that's missing in academia, that part, generally speaking. OK, I'd love to go a little further back. Uh, on the back right hand side, hand up still, yeah. Oh. Hi. Um, you, so you mentioned championing sort of UK, the ecosystem. And you've already sold one company. So I was wondering why you sold to Google. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And, and um, you know, at the time, this is 2014, uh, we had a big decision to make. So we had a lot of options. We, 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 were, we were clearly the world leaders in AI and we had this sort of amazing group of people uh, and that was very valuable. And we also had some really cool technology by then. We had the Atari program, you know, DQN. So we'd proven out our main pit of our thesis. And we had, a, we had some options to do. There were several companies that were interested, but also uh, our investors didn't want to sell. They wanted to continue. Um, but the reason we did it in the end was that I felt that uh, uh, we could accelerate our mission uh, within Google by using sort of, it's quite complementary what we had and what Google had. Like we, we needed their compute power. Um, their data was secondary, but actually the compute power is more important, but also their resources obviously to expand the team to like we're 500 people now with, you know, 300 PhDs. So we couldn't have done that. Uh, you know, in any, you know, so that's, that's expensive, right? So, so it would be difficult to do that uh, without having a, 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 you know, and concentrating on the research uh, without the backing of something like a Google. So I felt um, that was the right thing to do. And then when I, when I met Larry and, you, you know, and I report to Larry and we, we basically got on very well and he convinced me that he thought about Google as a, ultimately as an AI company. Uh, and that's become public sort of now. And so, uh, so it felt like he appreciated the significance of AI uh, as much as I did and understood it. And it was sort of as passionate about it as I was. Um, and then the final piece was we negotiated that we would run it. You know, I would basically run it like a CEO totally separately. We stay in London and build, build the London base here. And, um, and, you know, there would be no interference with the research program. So, um, and that's all transpired. So I think it would have been difficult to make as fast a progress as we have done without um, uh, that backing behind us. OK, the lady here. Thank you. You spoke about Sorry, learning. can you just wait for the microphone just so yeah. the guys at the back can hear? Thank you. I think she spoke about understanding learning how to learn or meta-learning. Yeah. With your team of 500 people, are you doing anything cool or different in how you help them learn to stay yes. at the top of their game? Yeah, so we, we, we are actually all the time. I mean, what I stress to people is that 
the whole of DeepMind is about learning, right? Everything. So, and of course, most of the people we've got are, are used to doing a lot of learning because they've, they've, you know, they've normally got, you know, gone all the way to PhD level and beyond. So they're they're good at that. What the interesting thing is, you've got to do is keep your humbleness about. Even if you're a world expert in your area, there's always something more you can learn, something more you can improve on. So my, a motto that I had for my myself from from very young was this Japanese word kaizen, which uh, means you know roughly translated, not direct translation of like continuous striving for continuous self-improvement and that's what I've tried to do in my life and that's what I try and embody uh, 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 in my culture at DeepMind is that you know we do it in our new starter talks and everything about um, everybody can learn something more and you've got all the world uh, look at this amazing environment you're in you've got you, you, if you want to know about something there's probably a world expert sort of sitting somewhere near you in that topic right if, if it's to do with machine learning or neuroscience so go and take advantage of that don't just stay siloed in the thing that you know how to do well. And I think generally speaking, people really are open to that and, and embrace it. And the other nice thing about academics, which a lot of our people uh, were ex-academics, is they love teaching and mentoring, generally speaking, uh, a lot of our professor type people. So they're already in that kind of mode. So it's actually quite a, it's quite a, you know, any one time I go through our canteen, I see all these amazing conversations, I mean, really amazing conversations going on around whiteboards and people teaching each other and brainstorming incredible things. And, and of course, what we're building are learning systems. So the whole, the whole thing is kind of, I call it a cathedral to the mind, right? Our whole, our whole building, our whole organization is, is, is to do, is like an ode to, to the mind. I love it. And right at the back, the blue uh, jacket, I think. Hi, Demis. You, uh, you hinted at synth uh, synthesizing data or synthetic data. Yeah. Do you have any views um, on tackling problems in domains where there might not be a lot of data today? Yeah. So, so my main solution to that would be, would be to build a simulation. So there's a kind of path you can think of. If you, if you have a paucity of real data, but you maybe have some, perhaps you've got enough to build uh, a, a handcrafted simulator of the system that you're interested in that at least approximates some of the properties of the real system. I mean, it's not going to be perfectly accurate, obviously, for most systems, but at least if it's, if it's got in, uh, close enough approximation, then potentially you can then build an AI system uh, that experiments in that and learns from that. So I think that that is a, a, a very powerful way to overcome, in some domains, a paucity of data. There is actually another interesting angle on this, which is that um, you could also uh, create another AI system, which are called generative models, which actually learn from the data you do have to create a generative model that can automatically generate new data from the same distribution. Right? So you could imagine, I could imagine in the future having one AI system that's generating the, the, the data um, that you know, maybe was trained on some real data, but not, there wasn't, which there wasn't very much of, and then that data being fed into a, a second AI system that tries to sort of understand it or work out how to make decisions in that environment. So I think there's lots of interesting research there to be done uh, on the simulation side. And this gentleman right in the front. Thank you. Um, just also on the fascinating subject of solving intelligence and also on meta-learning and creativity, do, um, do we not need some kind of universal algorithm to actually drive the learning process uh, within the deep learning? And in terms of that, would we not need to define, for example, what purpose is? Mm -hmm. Very difficult problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know that relates to the physics, biology, mm -hmm. thermodynamics, and mm -hmm. literally Nobel Prize uh, uh, winning work would, would need to be done as part of solving intelligence. Do you think you could be at the center of that? Because it seems as though you've done a lot of fantastic and amazing work already. Hmm. Well, we hope to be near the center of that. And I, I agree there's a lot of work that, need, you know, very hard work that needs to be done. I mean, if I understand your, your first question correctly, the, the, in terms of like uh, uh, the motivations of the system, you know, we're experimenting at the moment with, there's, there's obviously the idea of external rewards from the environment. So uh, reinforcement works like that. So, you know, if you win a game of Go, you get some reinforcement and then you basically means that you're more likely to do the actions that got you to that result uh, next time you're in that situation, right? 
right? Or in a similar situation. But the problem is the real world has is, is got very sparse rewards or maybe the rewards aren't specified. So how do you decide like what you should be optimizing? And then you can start thinking there's various solutions to that. You can start thinking about what we call intrinsic rewards. So uh, internal rewards that um, uh, reward things that are internal to the system rather than looking for external rewards. And they might be things like, there's a lot of hypotheses about that and we're testing all of these, but some of the big candidates are things to do with physics-based things like information gain. So uh, information gain being intrinsically rewarding. And actually there's some evidence in biology that this is the case, like novelty seeking it is actually rewarding. It releases dopamine. And so obviously if you see something novel, you're gaining a lot of information. So, and there are various theories of thermodynamics that sort of talk about actually uh, 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 that's what your brain's trying to do, is trying to uh, minimize the amount of energy, free energy it has in the system. So there's actually quite a lot of uh, interesting criteria um, that you could uh, try and maximize in the absence of um, external, any external rewards. Um, and then that, for, you know, the second question is like, uh, you know, how do you set those uh, objectives? I think, uh, you know, that's a very tricky question. And for games, it's very easy, right? You maximize the score or win the game. Um, for a lot of scientific problems, it can also be quite easy. Uh, you know, minimize energy, make make this uh, this certain property uh, 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 above a threshold. Um, but as you get into more and more human-based systems, I, I, it gets more messy and more complex as to how you specify, you know, the goal or the value of the system. So I think we have to, uh, you know, again, that's, that's becoming uh, sort of very cutting edge research to, to actually understand how we should do that. So we only have time for two more questions, I'm afraid. Gentlemen here with your hand up in the jacket. Hi, Hi. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Very uh, I have two questions for you. Just one, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you take validation on your thinking? when you started DeepMind, and how did you do that? Uh, both technical validation yeah. and commercial validation. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I didn't take, uh, I mean, if I'd taken too much validation, I would never have started <laughs> it. So, so, cause clearly I was going against the general consensus at the time. Um, but the thing is, but it's important not to, to take validation where you can. So one thing I always say to entrepreneurs is, uh, and something I learned from my first company is that you, you want to be like five years ahead of your time, not 50 years ahead. Because if, if your idea is 50 years ahead of its time, even if it's the right idea and, and you thought it through correctly, you're basically going to be in a world of pain in the, in the real world. It's just, it's just, there's going to be too many forces acting, acting against, you know, from raising money to convincing people this is the right thing or getting to commercialization quick enough. And so the great question is what I was trying to validate at the time was not my ideas about how to build AI that I already was doing in my scientific research and I was quite convinced of it was trying to calibrate was that the right time was I five years ahead uh, and not 50 and uh, that's a pretty hard art in itself to figure out and you kind of try and read the runes and sort of that's why I would 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 um, talk to people who are experts in certain components that I thought were required if it was going to be true that we were you know we were uh, right at this sort of vanguard but not you know, hopelessly in front. Uh, my, you know, my example of that would be Charles Babbage being 100 years too early with the computer, right? I mean, he was right, it works, this, you know, defense machine, but he, he you know, he, he died never seeing it uh, built. Um, so I think, you know, that's the validation that I took. Um, but if you're looking for validation and it's, the consensus is everyone says to you, yeah, do it, it's probably, you know, you're maybe too late already, actually. Okay, final question of the evening. <laughs> I'm liking your boldness. <laughs> I've, been, I've been waving hands. Right. So, uh, Demis, so what's your priority 1 to 10 about uh, building a global AI or probably a transfer compatibility learnings? Without knowledge transfer, addressing the knowledge transfer, you can't definitely move towards solving intelligence, which is your goal, right? So what's your priority of 1 to 10? Or, or one, 1 to 10 of what? Uh, transfer learning. Or of building transfer a, learning? Yeah. Of, yeah. Or right. what, the technique of transfer learning? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one that's of the most vital. Yeah. So transfer learning is when you, when you transfer your knowledge from one domain to a new, totally new domain. Um, and I think that is the key to actually general intelligence, right? And that's the thing that we as humans do amazingly well. And something I honed when I was 
you know, now I've played, for example, I've played so many board games now. Uh, when I, if someone was to teach me a new board game, I, I wouldn't be coming to that fresh anymore. I would know, you know, straight away I could apply all of these different heuristics to that I've learned from other games to this new one, even if I've never seen that before. And currently, no machines can do that. And I think the key to doing transfer learning is going to be uh, conceptual knowledge, so abstract knowledge. So the so the acquisition of conceptual uh, uh, knowledge that is abstracted away from the the, the perceptual details of where you learned it from. So then you can go, look, okay, I'll, I'll apply it to this new domain. And the example I always give on that with our Atari work is um, the game of Pong and Breakout. So both of those two are, you know, like that bat and ball games, but they look really different. Um, and our systems at the moment, you know, if you learn, if they learn to play Pong and then you give them Breakout, they, 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 won't be, you know, they won't learn breakout any more quickly than if you just gave them breakout straight away. And clearly that's wrong, right? Obviously they should be translating the notion of sort of Newtonian mechanics from one to the other. Um, and at the moment they don't because all the knowledge is implicit. So they've learned how to predict the ball going around the screen in one game, but they, they, they haven't made that explicit conceptual knowledge. So they can't, there's no way of transferring that knowledge to the new perceptual domain. They, it just, it, the system just regards it as a, a totally new problem. Um, so I think that's actually like, you know, one of the, the, the big uh, challenges to be tackled towards uh, general AI. A fascinating note to end on. Um, uh, unfortunately, Demis has to go to a different engagement after this, so can't stay around to talk. Um, but I just wanted to do a, a massive thank you. It's been a fascinating evening. Um, I've loved hearing more. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Israel.